Hey, Sim Kawakami here, 49ers plus minus with my co-host, Matt Barros. Barros, a lot going on with the 49ers, kind of in between, right in between the big waves of free agency. Owners meetings come up next week, and then that's the big lead up to, to the draft. What do you think of the, the most significant things that have happened, let's say, in the last week or so with the 49ers? Well, they added another quarterback who could turn out to be their, their number two quarterback, uh, which could, you know, obviously be a big deal if, if Brock Purdy got hurt. And um, he's been banged up the last couple of years. Um, obviously, uh, the elbow last year, he suffered a concussion. I think it was the uh, the Minnesota game in week seven. He never had to miss any time because of it. But 17 game schedule, you figure that number two guy is going to um, start a game or two at least in, in a normal year. So uh, Josh Dobbs is that guy, and, and he'll compete with Brandon Allen to be the number two. Uh, Allen's the incumbent, so uh, he's been here a year, so he's got a little bit of a head start. But Dobbs is sort of a, a more uh, impressive um, uh, physical specimen. He can he can run. Uh, he's got a nice arm. It's not a it's not a great arm, but um, it's it's probably more than. Brandon Allen has. So uh, a, a good number two to Brock Purdy, who also um, is good on the hoof a, as well. So that's probably the biggest thing that they've done in the last week. Yeah, I like Dobbs. I liked him last season. I know the, the stats weren't always great. Gets traded from the Cardinals to the Vikings. And that's to me, it felt like kind of like we got to get him out of here uh, when before Kyler comes back because we don't want the rest of the team to feel like this could be our quarterback. And he's not clearly not that talented, but I like him. I think he kind of plays a tough style. I think he can play in that kind of sh Shanahan, move the pocket a little bit, do the play action. Uh, like, yeah, he, maybe Brandon Allen is the guy you put in there for to finish a game. And Josh Dobbs is the guy, like, you got to play four games. He's going to play your four games. That's kind of how, how I feel. You Would you agree with that? And, I, you know, not really a comp with Darnold, because Darnold, higher talent. So maybe Darnold was the guy no matter what, but – Kind of, would you feel like kind of a co-backup with Allen in sort of the way I talked about? Yeah, I mean, I, I would give uh, the advantage probably to to Dobbs just because of the kind of physical tools, and I think he's making a little bit extra money. It's not a it's not a considerable amount where you say, "Ah, oh, aha, this guy's the clear number two. but it's it's a bit more. Um, you know, I, I think most people had written Josh Dobbs off last year. Uh, he bounced around a number of teams, um, never really uh, kind of stuck, never really had a extended, um, you know, uh, starting experience. And then he he goes to the the Cardinals, not a very good team. And I, I think uh, a couple of things happened. The 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 49ers played the Cardinals. I want to say week four last year. In week three, a game the 49ers would have studied very closely. That was the Cardinals' upset over the Cowboys, where, where, jo where Dobbs looked really good. And then he looked good against the, the 49ers, too. I mean, that, that game wasn't close in the end. It was a blowout for the 49ers. But, but Dobbs, um, very efficient, very tough. Um, he, he beat them early. My point being is that when the 49ers took a long look at Josh Dobbs last season, there was a lot to like. Uh, did you ever buy the – Potential talk they're looking at Zach Wilson. I, I listen. I'm never going to shoot down anything. It, you, Shanahan and Lynch could do whatever they want. Who knows? I think they liked him coming out of the draft, or at least they assumed he was going to go ahead of them. They just kind of wrote him down as the two pick, so they wouldn't get a chance to draft him. And their guys, you know, it was their former coaches who who took him with the Jets. But I never took seriously that they were really going to be involved with Zach Wilson. I just don't think they want to get back into that whole debate again over 2021. Like they're going to want to – not that they'll run away from talent, but I just don't think they want to get back in that discussion. Uh, did you hear anything about Zach Wilson, and what did you think of it? No, I didn't hear anything about uh, Zach Wilson. I mean, I thought that at one point if they were really intent on Jeff Ulbrich – there might have been some very kind of creative deal where they basically take Zach Wilson off of the Jets' hands and you know assume some of his uh, his salary costs or a big chunk of it in order to get uh, to get Ulbrich. I, you know the Ulbrich thing was kind of fast and furious early on, but I think the Jets made it clear you're you're not getting him. 
so so the 49ers moved on from that and there wasn't any sort of uh, creative back and forth at all. But um, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it would just be too high profile. You're, you're going with Brock Purdy as your starter. You don't want to kind of bring in uh, an intriguing uh, number two like that. He would have cost money. Um, and I agree with you. I mean, um, I, I think the 49ers have um, had a lot of drama related to that uh, that particular draft, and they don't want any more of it. Anything else strike you from that? You know, like some other Brandon Parker, some other names. Uh, I might have missed some while I was on vacation a little bit. Uh, but uh, just as this kind of points to the draft, anything that kind of sets it up in your mind, any player or two that you go, okay, I understand how they're doing this. That leads to that in April. Yeah, I think it's more of um, we're going to kind of take care of the clear holes on this roster in free agency so that we have a, a bit more freedom in, in April. Um, I think that there were there were some offensive linemen available in free agency, but they're, they're, they weren't um, in the 49ers eyes um, significant upgrades over who they have. And they would have paid a significant dollar amount for these guys. These are guys who were probably drafted in the middle rounds uh, four years ago who um, didn't start right away, but who, who did just enough in the last year, maybe year or two, to become intriguing. And when you become intriguing on the offensive line, especially a tackle, there's so few of them that you end up making a lot of money. Teams overpay for these guys. So I, I think the 49ers were – were hesitant to do that, uh, which you know still points to them making a big move, especially a tackle. I think um, in this uh, tackle rich draft, so every all, all the signs continue to point that way. I thought some of these, um, you know, you you were away, and these these names probably didn't strike you, but they signed uh, Ezekiel Turner, who's a uh, a linebacker, a very kind of light linebacker, two twenty type of guy, really good on special teams. Isaac Yidam, uh, a cornerback, really good on special teams. So they, they uh, you know, for the second time in, in really uh, the last few years, they've, they've gone big on special teams coverage guys. I think this is all done because they drafted Jake Moody last year in the third round, in part because he's a good kickoff guy. He can put the kickoffs wherever he wants. And he did that a few times in 2023. These short kickoffs in the corner, it's exactly what these special teams coordinators want. But the 49ers just couldn't, no. couldn't stop the uh, the opponent from, from getting back to the 30, the 35. Um, it was bizarre because he did um, what they wanted, what, what they thought that they were missing with Robbie Gold, and the coverage units um, still lapsed. So uh, that's been an ongoing problem. I mean, we're, we're working on three or four years where the coverage – units despite getting bulked up in the off season, you know, George Odom or in Burks, they draft uh, Talano Hufanga. I mean, two years ago, the coverage units were supposed to be elite. They weren't. And um, they're still sort of uh, kind of bang on that door to, to have that. And I think that's all trying to get everything in concert with what Moody does well. All right. What holes do they have then? I mean, we, we've talked about tackle for a long time, right? Tackle and whether McKivitz moves in to, to play guard. Uh, can they ha can, can they not have a right tackle uh, draft in the first one? Like, could they possibly say, you know what, McKivitz is okay at right tackle? Or do you think they're just going to get a right tackle in the first round? I, I think they're going to, I mean, there's supposed to be five or six, and then they start to run out right at 31. So, um, if you want to get one that really kind of suits you, I think they have to be prepared to move a little bit further into the first round, say the, the low twenties to, to get that, that player. But e even if they did, I'm not sure that that player starts over McKibbin, certainly in week one, that player might be the swing tackle. He'd have to beat out, uh, Parker and, uh, Jalen Moore to get that job. You know, that, that shouldn't be hard to do for a first round pick, but Boy, the, the 49ers have been really hesitant to play some of these guys early on. Aaron Banks, for example, was a second rounder. He barely got in. Uh, Spencer Burford got in quite a bit as a rookie, uh, but he was platooning at that time with Daniel Brunskill. And then he never really kind of took that second year leap that the 49ers were, were hoping to. So um, 
you know, the, the, the 49ers are a hard team to please. They don't play a lot of rookies um, as it is. And I think along the offensive line, that's, that's emphasized. So um, just because they, they take a first rounder at that position, I wouldn't take that as a signal that that guy has moved McKivitz out of the lineup um, at all, really. I mean, I would still think that McKivitz starts whatever that week one game is. So um, I do think that that's, that's a, a gaping hole. Safety is a concern, um, you know, especially with Hufanga coming back from the ACL. They don't know, you know, if he's going to be ready for week one. Um, Jair Brown showed some things uh, as a rookie, but, you know, there were some issues as well as a rookie. So two guys you're not quite sure about. I think that they want to do their thing. They do this every year where they wait on that safety market and then get a veteran at a very low cost who can be a, a backstop to those two young guys. And I think that's uh, that's what they're doing right now. Gibson was like, what, in the first week of training camp or something like that? That was like really late when they when they dropped him in there. And he gave him a, he's given him a couple of really good years. Uh, have they replaced Eric? We, last time we talked, I think we weren't sure whether Armstead was going to be leaving or not. Now we know that they, they didn't come to a restructuring deal. They released him and he is signed elsewhere uh, with Trent Baalke, right? That's the, that, that made a lot of sense. Yeah. And, uh, and making basically the same salary he would have made here. So yeah. Baalke stepped to the table and, and, and good for Eric Armstead. I mean, he needs sort of bet on himself and we were wondering, Oh, gee, Coming off these injuries, he's 31. Um, should he really be kind of testing the market at this point? But when he did, he was far and away the best uh, uh, defensive tackle available there. And I think that's been a theme in, in free agency this year, that defensive tackle is starting to approach uh, defensive end and offensive tackle as as one of these kind of elite positions that you're you're willing to pay a little bit extra for. And so – the uh, the Balkies, uh picked him up, arm length. So what are the Four Niners doing at defense tackle? Then are are they set there, or is that a pretty big need too? They're they're good there. They uh, they basically you know exchanged uh, Malik Collins for Eric Armstead. Collins is two years younger. I think he's got two more years on his deal. He's not as good as Eric Armstead. Um, you know the the hope is that he's more healthy than Eric Armstead has been. So he's got two more years on his deal. Um, Javon Hargrave is 30, 31. Um, they, they also signed um, Jordan Elliott. He's sort of in that um, Javon Kinlaw role now. He's going to line up next to Kevin Givens. So the, uh, the four, the four defensive tackles, your starters and then your backup unit are going to be Hargrave, Collins, and then – Givens and Elliott with this other newbie newcomer um, uh, Yitor Gross Matos being able to kind of uh, shift inside to defensive at tackle on, on rushing down. So I, I think that they're covered there. It's not covered to the point where if all the offensive tackles are gone and they're sitting there at 31 and there's a really good defensive tackle there, I wouldn't put it past them to to do their usual thing and, and go D line there as well, uh, because th that that player conceivably could be on that second unit early on, and then when one of the older guys moves on, uh, one way or the other, he's he's ready to step into the fold. One thing I noted as all these signs were coming in, I wasn't writing about it, I was like checking their stats especially on that defensive line as a brought guys. And I saw played 16 games last year, played 17 games last year, played 15 games last year, played 16 games last year. And, and we know Armstead has struggled. The one thing, the, the one mark against him is he's been injured the last two seasons with pretty major stuff, right? Like potentially like carrying on, like this could be a problem in the next season. It just, and Ken Law we know has struggled, although with health, although he played pretty consistently last season. I expect to hear that from Shanahan when he talks at the owners meetings. Like, like that was a major, major point of emphasis for them. Um, you know, guys who they can count on, guys who will be there, out there every snap that they that they need them for. Obviously, they have Greenlaw who's hurt. Like, they just need guys who can produce. Do you think that was an underlying thing for them in this free agency? Oh yeah, I think for sure. I think um, you know consistency. I mean, I think that uh, you know they basically played the second half of or the last third of the season without Armstead and. 
um, and suffered for it. I mean, they weren't good against the run I and mean, very basic things. Um, Armstead um, either being absent or playing injured plus Cleveland Furl um, missing um, in the playoffs really, really affected them. Um, it, it was clear they, you know, they barely made it out of those first two, two games in large part be, because of those issues. So um, to me, I think that the big signing is Leonard Floyd at that, at that end spot. Again, another guy that, you know, um, ha- has been durable. And more than that, he's just consistent every play. He's just giving everything he has, um, it, it, which is, you know, uh, not what they got from, from Chase Young. And, and, and Chase Young's defense, we're learning now that he was dealing with a significant neck injury. Uh, which is going to require surgery and which which sort of tamped down his market uh, in free agency. So, um, you know, he's coming off the the, the knee issue, which was a, a, a huge deal, a really bad injury for him. And then he was dealing with a neck as well, which explains why he didn't look like the player that he was in, in 2020 when he won Defensive uh, Rookie of the Year. But inconsistency was the issue with him in the playoffs. Floyd is basically the the polar opposite of that. Um, maybe not as physically gifted, um, isn't um, you know isn't one of the you know Micah Parsons uh, type of pass rusher. But boy, if they if they got nine or ten sacks from from that position where, where they've been getting four or five, um, that, that's a big deal. I mean, I, I think that uh, um, that would help the defense out, and I think there's real potential with Nick Bosa getting all the chips and double teams that he gets that nine or 10 might be on the uh, kind of the, the low end of what uh, uh, Leonard Floyd is capable of. Yeah. I, I, I'm kind of thinking of him as kind of a bendy, uh, you know, Cleveland Furl, like, you know, Furl was real solid, st- stood up to the run. I know Floyd's a pretty good run player too, I think. Uh, but Furl's kind of consistency with some outside edge rush to him. Uh, that's how I'm kind of looking at it. like a dependable guy who might get to the, to the quarterback four or five more times more than Furl did. And that'd be huge. That would be gigantic for them. I know like I, I you know, I thought Daniel Hunter was something that they could look at. I'm sure they looked at it. Maybe the price was just too high when you've got your pain, Nick Bose, $34 million a year and Floyd at 10. Makes a lot more sense. You know, that's a nice kind of thing. Uh, but they did need another guy over there, and Floyd might be a, a real, real answer to, for them. Um, another thing I want to bring up is Brandon Ayuk. We're going to have 5,000 trade rumors about him. There's already been like 2,000 of them. Any of those do you take seriously? Jacksonville is a big little fl- flurry over there. Uh, obviously, that'd be interesting trading with with Trent Baalke. The, the pick number sounds about, was it, was it, what are they, 14, right in that area? That sounds about the right pick number for him, maybe a little even a little high. Uh, and the other one was Pittsburgh. I don't even know why some social media thing. Uh, where are you with Ayuk and anything that smells like there might be something, you know, not saying it's going to happen. Don't aggregate this, but like you're kind of paying attention to any specific team with him. I mean, th- those two jump out. I mean, uh, Brandon Ayuk, um, he basically tweeted at Mike Tomlin the, <laughs> the other day. So, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't take much of uh, much sleuthing to, to kind of figure that one out. Um, he was suggesting that he and Tomlin look alike. There, there was a, a physical resemblance there. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Steelers are looking for a wide receiver. Um, you know, they've been, they've been looking at um, uh, Boyd from Cincinnati, for example, who's from Pittsburgh and went to Pitt. Uh, so they've been shopping in that department. Um, yeah. 14 with the Jaguars is interesting. Um, you know, I, I think the, the 40, if, if the Jaguars offered pick number 14 for Brandon Ayuk, I think that's enough that the 49ers absolutely pick up the phone and they consider that. I don't, I don't think that they think that they would get that offer. Um, for example, two years ago, uh, Debo Samuel was coming off, you know, the greatest, uh, wide receiver season since, uh, for a 49ers receiver since T.O. was here, um, carried the team throughout the playoffs, et cetera, et cetera. They got, I, th- I believe that they got their best offer for him. It came during the draft, was from the Jets, who had the 10th overall pick. 
but and the Jets wanted Debo Samuel plus the 49ers second round pick mm-hmm. for that pick. So I don't know what that comes out to, but it's not, you know, it it devalues that number. It's like that, a second round. It's like a second round pick. It's right. Like a round, yeah. Right. So uh, basically a second round pick. So, you know, that's what I imagine that the Jaguars would offer. If it's 14, then it's it's for Brandon IU plus a couple of other things. And I, I don't think, you know, if the 49ers um, turn down th- those picks for Debo Samuel, I think that they would do the same for Brandon Ayuk. I, I think that they're actually a little higher on Ayuk right now than they were on Debo Samuel two years ago for various reasons. I mean, um, you know, they, they've got Christian McCaffrey, as, as you pointed out in the past. McCaffrey does a lot of the things that, Debo Samuel does. They, Debo Samuel's uh, had, I don't want to say weight issues, but it, it's been a topic. Um, he needs to keep his weight down, this, that, and the other. Um, he was going kind of full mental at that point, agitating for a trade. I don't know if Brandon Ayuk's ever going to kind of reach that level. So again, if they, if they didn't make the move for, for Samuel, I think it's got to be a really tremendous offer for them to make the move for Ayuk this year. God, if they trade IU, I just think they'd. Have, I, I said the same thing about Debo, and I think even this even more for IU, they'd have to have a immediate pathway to getting his replacement. Like if it was if the Jets' first pick that year, it would have been Garrett Wilson. Like yeah, sure, you know, like that I'd do. Now is fourteen going to do that for you? If you've got to give up two, also maybe, and I don't think Jacksonville might not even do that. But you better have like we know who the next guy is. And it, he'll be under cost control, and that's it. If it's not for that, and believe me, that ain't Zay Jones. <laughs> you know, so the other name is supposedly in a rumor. Um, I don't think the work they're trying to win a Super Bowl. Like <laughs> they need a tackle, and they're trying to win a Super Bowl, and you don't give up a receiver, so then you got to you need a receiver and a tackle. So um, I, I, unless there's somebody jumping out, and again, I, I just don't see that. He just doesn't seem to be the kind of receiver who gets that kind of offer. He's not AJ Brown. You know, he, he's not Tyreek Hill. He's really good, and he's so valuable to the 49ers. I just don't see a team with a 14th pick or the 16th pick or whatever Pittsburgh is saying, okay, we'll give you that pick. You you draft a great receiver with that. Done deal. I don't know that that's going to happen. You know what? If you're one of those teams, you might as well just use that pick to, to draft a receiver, right? That's And you don't have to pay Brandon Ayuk $22 million a year. That, that This is the equation that comes into play. And I'm sure that was the equation with Debo. Like, teams probably valued him very highly. But then they knew they'd have to turn around and pay him $22 million a year. And that became the question. And and do you have the offense that fits him? With Ayuk is is much more scheme bet. You know, he fits so many different schemes, but I don't know that the value is the same as so just draft Roma Dunze, right? I mean, just you got the ninth pick, you just draft him. So uh, you know, I don't know if nine's gonna do it. For... Yeah, maybe higher. I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, one of those Texas guys or whoever, like, you know, like you're just going to have a little bit of an option there rather than trade a top 12 top 15 pick for him um all right the, you got shanahan speaking for the first time uh, in a while at the owners meetings coming up next week uh, i know lombardi's going but you and i will be both monitoring very closely these tend to be very interesting kyle appearances uh what yeah. what do you want to hear from him uh what, what things are still on, you know, we need to hear. Well, I mean, Brandon Staley is like the first thing I'm like, what is he? He's not said anything. They haven't even announced Sorensen as a defense no. coordinator, right? Yeah. So they got to announce that or talk about that. Why Sorensen? What do you like about him? What's Brandon Staley's really role really going to be? That's what I want to hear from him. What are some other things? Or, or you can add to that. Uh, what are some things you want to hear from Shanahan? Yeah. I mean, what's what's Brandon Staley's role going to be? Where are these guys going to be on, on game day? Um, yeah, they have to replace... Clint Kubiak, who's with the Saints. I mean, what was the replacement there? Is Brian Greasy in that spot? And is the Kubiak brother, Clay, now the quarterback's coach? Right now, Clay is the assistant quarterback's coach. Kubiak, the... Uh, <laughs> the other. The, the, uh, Greasy, <laughs> the quarterback's coach. These are all the same names. Well, they, didn't, they, just, they didn't rename all the offensive coaches Kubiak. <laughs> they just, we just throw them all. Kubiak, yeah, Kubiak, yeah. Kubiak too. So yeah, there there are some um, some reshufflings. I, I last I checked, he still hadn't hired an assistant defensive line coach. Uh, Daryl Tapp is now um, with Adam Peters in Washington. So um, that was sort of the, the last piece of the puzzle. And, and once that's all done, 
he's going to announce it. Maybe that happens next week. So, um, yeah, that'll be awesome. Uh, that'll be interesting. He'll talk about these uh, these free agency signings. And, um, you know, we might get some clues. I mean, I'm sure he's going to be asked about Ayuk. I don't think his his answer is going to be any different than it always is. Hey, if we get a great, you know, anybody's uh, tradable. I'm, I'm tradable. John's tradable. We're going to hear that um, again. And I think that's 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 accurate. Um, you know, going back to Ayuk, I remember two years ago, there were a couple of wide receivers that if the 49ers – um, did trade Debo Samuel, they almost would have been obligated to draft these guys uh, in the first round. They didn't do do a lot. Of, I mean, they, they didn't come in on, for, uh, you, know, uh, you know, site visits here to Santa Clara. 49ers didn't do much pre-draft work on those guys. So over the next month, it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, Rome Adunze comes in, Malik Neighbors comes in, any of those guys. If they don't, it, it, it's hard to see at least the 49ers thinking that they're going to part ways because um, the problem is that there are some really good wide receivers in this draft. Neighbors, LSU guy, is like, uh, you know, the perfect Kyle Shanahan guy, great route runner, big, um, really good at the catch. He's almost like a composite of Debo and Ayuk. He's probably going to go number four overall. Uh, and then the next uh, re- receiver Harrison might go five and then the Adunze goes six. So if the 49ers got 14, they would have to package it with 31, even to kind of think about getting up high enough to get one of those guys. And that means that you don't get your offensive tackle in the first round. Um, and then um, if they didn't, it, the the next receiver isn't, isn't going until, you know, the twenties or so. So there's a big gap between the, those top three and whoever the number four wide receiver is. So uh, I, that it doesn't really kind of work out for the 49ers in that regard. Anything else you want to hear from Shanahan? I, I, I had a few things in my head. I, I've lost them at this point. But uh, anything specific that Shanahan hasn't really addressed? Like Mick Lombardi, the, there's one offensive coach they're bringing in. Like what's Mick Lombardi's role going to be? We, you know, we're all familiar with him. He's you know, he's Michael Lombardi's son. He's been he was Harbaugh's what assistant uh, when Harbaugh was here. Then he's he's been around. He was the Raiders' offensive coordinator. I'm just curious about his role, where he fits in the Shanahan staffing uh, situation. Anything else uh, you're curious to hear from Shanahan? Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's it's mostly uh, coaching staff related, which which is a big deal. Um, I think that the the Brandon Staley stuff is going to be interesting, not only from what. Staley is going to be doing on a day-to-day basis, but whether Staley had influence on any of these, uh, these free agency picks, I mean, um, Leonard Floyd played for him in two different spots. And I think that they've got a really close connection there. And so that, that's sort of the idea. I mean, it's a good question. Staley does a, a lot of things differently than what the 49ers have done on defense. So does Staley coming in mean that the 49ers are going to, change tactics in some ways. I, I think the answer is no, because they went in-house with the coordinator. But um, it's interesting that we're, we're asking all these questions about Staley, Staley, Staley. No, one, yeah. no one's really asking any questions about Sorensen, who's the, the defensive coordinator. I think Kyle, and it, he did address the Steve Wilkes firing briefly uh, in a phone call, but not expansively. I think there's still room for him to discuss what happened there. Uh, and whether he made a mistake hiring him or whether there were things that he needed to see when he first questioned, and we can say when he pulled him down from the booth to the field, uh, or was it, you know, the play in the Super Bowl where he had a call time? Like, I don't know that he's going to get that specific, but we know with Kyle, like sometimes he does get expansive and gets very specific. Like what exactly went wrong with Steve Wilkes? And when did he realize that was the case? Could he have fired him even if they won the Super Bowl? Like he hasn't really talked about that. I don't know that he's going to talk about that in Florida, but I kind of would like to hear that. Maybe I'll talk to him about that at some point. But I don't know that he's really gotten into the heart of the Wilkes thing. Do you? Well, I mean, it could be that they knew early on. I mean, remember one of their first free agency signings was – um, Isaiah Oliver last year, who played mm-hmm. in the same division as Wilkes. I don't know if Wilkes had um, 
influence on that, whether he's the one who wanted sort of a, a bigger bodied nickel to come in. But um, it, it seemed like, you know, everything that Wilkes touched almost from the get go um, didn't work out very well. And they were they were, you know, that that nickel decision haunted them all season long. They couldn't figure that one out. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, uh, you know, if, if that's a sort of a, a Wilkes related mistake, um, you know, we're, we're starting, you know, we, we, you could build a, uh, a timeline starting in March of yeah, last true. year where true. things just aren't, aren't happening. Right. I mean, it's just a, a bad fit from jump there. And, um, I doubt that he's going to go into that just cause, uh, you know, it, it, it would paint Wilkes so poorly. And I don't think Sh- Shanahan's interested in doing that. Uh, but it's it's interesting. I'd be curious. I mean, we may never know this. Also, like, was Nick Sorensen against that? Right? Was he pushing against? You know, that those are the interesting things. That like he was on staff for all this stuff. Uh, I think he was downstairs, right? He was always downstairs. Was Nick Sorensen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's always been down there. Um, you know, I, I, I'm working on a profile on Nick Sorensen. I don't want to give away all the the oh, juicy no. details here. Oh no. But um, it's been suggested that um, he's a lot like Pete Carroll, and and, and Carroll loved him. Um, he was in Seattle for a while, and and Carroll saw him as a future defensive coordinator. Um, what happened was that in Jacksonville, um, Brian Schneider had to leave abruptly. That he was their special teams coordinator, and he had to leave due to a personal matter. And I think it was in June, and. Um, uh, Schneider had previously been in Seattle and he'd worked with Sorensen. Sorensen at this point is still in Seattle and it, he's on the fast track to become, uh, you know, a, a high level assistant under Pete Carroll, but he's got this opportunity now. Trent Balky calls him back to ball. Everything goes back to Trent, Trent Balky. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, that comes as no surprise to this person right here, right? Okay. Everything's Trent Balky. Trent Trent Baalke calls him and says, hey, I mean, we, we, uh, we need a special teams coordinator. Can you do it? And he has to make a decision. And so he leaves Seattle and becomes the special teams coordinator. This is still the Urban Meyer-led Jaguars at this point. And then everything falls apart at that point. It ends up being a, a mistake for Sorensen because there's no, not his fault, but um, the, the Jaguars topple because uh, Urban Meyer is such a, a bad fit there. Um, and so um, it, it's interesting because I think that um, Sorensen would have been a nice fit in that Pete Carroll defense. I think he's a lot like Carroll, very much a player's coach. Everybody likes him, extremely likable, extremely positive, that type of, uh, that type of guy. So um, that's probably the best uh, comparison that I, that I can give him at this point. Pretty good one. I'm sure Balky said, listen, I got the defensive backs. You coach <laughs> <the defensive backs."> <laughs> <laughs> right. That's how they save money in Jacksonville. <laughs> God bless Trent Balky. Without him, what the hell would we joke about all the time? All right. Uh, Barrows, anything else? We cover a lot of things there. Uh, I am sort of back from vacation, so now I can start pay- really paying attention, but uh, we, neither of us will be in Florida, but we will be paying Close attention to the always anticipated, especially now that he blows off uh, the combine, the always anticipated Kyle Shanahan appearance at the owners' meetings, uh, coaches, uh, coaches' breakfast, I think they call that. Uh, and we'll, I think that's probably Tuesday, I would guess, Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, it's early too, and it's yeah. early. It's early for them, so, so it's, it's really oh early for us. It's like, really <laughs> early for Kyle Shanahan too. If uh, yep. if memory serves, those have kind of <laughs> snuck up on him in the past. <laughs> Makes for better Kyle Shanahan uh, performances sometimes, especially if you ask about if he's going to trade Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, and he'll probably like talk about everybody p- perhaps not living till Friday. Who, who knows with him? It's always Kyle, the, the snarky, uh, grouchy Kyle is always very interesting, as I always say. I never mind that one. Yeah, Corey, Corey Rush, the PR guy, his biggest job is making sure that Shanahan is, is up ahead of that uh, press event and that there's like a big steaming yes. cup of coffee waiting for him. <laughs> two of them, two of them. <laughs> Espresso shots. All right, Barrows, we will talk at some point next week after Kyle Shanahan's uh, session and whatever else happens there. Uh, always good to talk to you, and we will talk again later. Okay, sounds good. See you, everybody.